scientists predict a massive hurricane is overdue to hit New York City. 130 mile an hour winds, debris choked storm surge, damage in the billions of dollars, fatalities in the hundreds, if not thousands. A mega disaster. A hurricane in the New York metropolitan area is far more dangerous than anywhere in the United States. Many New Yorkers are unaware that what happened to New Orleans could happen to them. It can. 67 years before Katrina, a killer hurricane smashed into New York and New England. It is still one of the deadliest hurricanes to make landfall in the United States. Using historical records and the latest meteorological predictions, we'll go inside the eye of a killer hurricane as it hits one of the greatest cities in the world. City. A humid Thursday in September. Commuters clog the financial district. Cabbies fight for fares outside Penn Station. It could be any fall day in the world's most vibrant city. But it's not. A devastating Category 3 hurricane is headed for New York. Most people in the North think of hurricanes as things that happen to people on warm, palm-fringe coasts. The historical record clearly tells us that this is not so. Northern hurricanes are more infrequent, but when they come, they're catastrophic. Tropical depressions often move across the Atlantic Ocean from West Africa. If one of these depressions expands and becomes a tropical storm as it moves east toward the United States, the National Hurricane Center in Miami will start to monitor the storm around the clock. It's very hard to be mentally prepared for something that happens relatively infrequently but can have such significant consequences. With little warning, this tropical storm could develop into a hurricane and shift course pick up wind speed, and head north to New York City. This is no theory. This is fact. This could be one of the worst disasters America will ever confront. We could see storm surge elevations of about 30 feet, which means that we have a serious uh, amount of uh, population that we need to get out of the hazard area. This storm surge will rush the city in a raging torrent of wind, rain, and waves. It is not a question of if, it is a question of when and how big. It will begin like this. A Bermuda high pressure system will lock in close to the shore. A continental high will move in from the west. The large hurricane will be caught in the jet stream. New York will have no more than a day and a half's warning. Our challenge in this situation is to match up the timing of the approaching storm, take those hours that we know that we need to, to get the job done, and kind of put a timeline together that makes sure that we get everything accomplished before that storm makes landfall. As a major urban area of over 20 million people, there is a limit to how New York can prepare for one of the world's most deadly mega disasters. We can see the additional problems that a catastrophe brings in an urban environment versus a more rural environment. 120,000 cars pass through the Lincoln Tunnel every day. There are 7 million daily subway riders. They may not be able to get out. In the event of a weekday mega hurricane, Manhattan could become a waterlogged prison. The challenge for us is, is that there's never been an evacuation of really any kind in the city of New York. Police, fire, FEMA, Coast Guard, 
the city calls for all hands on deck. By 1 a.m. on the day of the storm, the National Hurricane Center will put out a hurricane warning for the northeast coast. In this area, hurricanes tend to be very fast moving. So a storm could look like it's not headed toward the northeast and then suddenly make a turn and quickly start moving in our direction. It doesn't seem possible that this fortress of marble and steel could be vulnerable to wind and rain, but it is. According to our estimates, the two cities or the two metropolitan areas along the U.S. coastline where we could see total economic damages in excess of $250 billion from a hurricane are Miami and New York. And there are really two separate factors. One is the nature of the hurricane that'll be hitting. That's the northern hurricane that moves two to three times faster and is immense in size. Then there's the nature of the area. We have a very gentle continental shelf, which allows us to build up huge amounts of surge level. The area most vulnerable to that storm surge is in the right angle formed by the shorelines of New Jersey and New York. This region is known as the New York Bight. When you have a right angle like this and you have a hurricane rotating counterclockwise, it's pushing water into that right angle and there's no place for it to go. So it pours into Jamaica Bay and it pours into New York Harbor to abnormally high heights. Friday, rush hour. After 36 hours of making its way up the coast, the hurricane reaches New York City. The roaring storm is now 200 miles wide, with an eye wall that measures 20 miles across. Winds at the center of the right eye wall swirl counterclockwise at over 150 miles an hour. Hundreds of homes along the water's edge in New Jersey and Long Island are destroyed. In the outer boroughs, single-family homes suffer severe roof damage from the intense pressure. Hundreds of thousands of commuters are stranded. JFK Airport is inundated by 28 feet of surging water. The storm barrels past the Statue of Liberty and hits Manhattan at high tide. A 26-foot storm surge engulfs the southern tip of Manhattan. Abandoned taxis and buses are swamped in Battery Park. 130 mile an hour winds rip debris from every rooftop in the city. The subways fill with corrosive salt water and grind to a halt. There will be trees down, there will be roof damage, there will be window and cladding damage. And you can't go down to your local ATM and get any money. Most of the stores aren't going to be open. There's no electricity, so a lot of things that we take for granted are not going to be available. But there is one variable in this doomsday equation, the New Yorker. There is no doubt there still is a complacency factor. Um, you know, people still do not believe uh, that hurricanes are prevalent in this area. We've been to many communities where there are residents who continue to tell us they will not evacuate. And these are the people that will remain in harm's way, so we could experience fatalities um, or injuries. The lull during the middle of the storm's landfall will be a dangerous midpoint for New Yorkers. Skies clear. It may appear the worst is over. It's not. This brief respite is followed by an incredibly fast-moving surge that drowns anyone in its path. The worst winds and surge start to subside. But police and firefighters are still crippled by flooding and dangerous electrical and gas lines. The deadly Category 3 storm will be the most shocking event to hit the city since 9-11. But this mega disaster will come as no surprise to scientists and emergency management officials. It's going to happen. It's going to happen at any time. September 21st, 1938. A hurricane nicknamed the Long Island Express rammed into the south shore of Long Island, New York at 2.30 in the afternoon. Within hours, over 700 people were dead. 
more than 50,000 people were left homeless. The storm of 38 is one of the worst hurricanes of the century, an event almost forgotten today. But hidden within this mega disaster are secrets that may condemn today's New York or save it. Experts believe a Category 3 hurricane could devastate New York City in the near future. When this killer storm comes, there will be massive power outages and loss of life. Debris-filled water will flood lower Manhattan. Fierce winds will rip apart buildings. Water is back up about a foot. For many New Yorkers, it will seem inconceivable that a killer storm could hit this far north. But storms have plagued the Northeast for hundreds of years. The great colonial hurricane occurred in uh, 1635 and was a complete surprise to the English settlers who had never seen a hurricane before. Damage was recorded in the Providence plantations, in the Plymouth colony, and in the Massachusetts Bay colony. Major hurricanes also hit New York and New England in the 1900s. But the storm that struck Long Island on September 21st, 1938, would define the destructive potential of a New York City hurricane. The 1938 hurricane was a horrific event. People on Long Island did not even understand the word hurricane. It had sustained winds of around 120 miles an hour with gusts to over 150 miles an hour. With 48 states, as the scene of In 1938, meteorology was a much more primitive science. There was no Doppler radar. The only protection against these storms was individual storm trackers watching the sky and sea. The hurricane was headed toward Miami, but at 7 o'clock, storm trackers in Jacksonville, Florida observed that the storm had started to veer north. The churning wall of water and wind reached Cape Hatteras, North Carolina a day later. A high-pressure system off the coast and one along the Alleghenies created a chute for the storm to fly up the shoreline. One of the factors surrounding the surprise attack of the storm was the lack of eyewitness data and information. We used to get a lot of information from ship data, and they had ability to go from ship to ship to shore. During the 38th storm, I think a lot of what happened was is the ships got out of the way. You know, they're not stupid. There was not much information that was gathered. One of the largest hurricanes in recorded history was moving up the coast, and nobody knew it was coming. In 1938, meteorologists believed that the colder water temperatures of the North Atlantic were incompatible with the energy needed to produce a hurricane. A common fallacy in thinking about hurricanes in the North is that the cold water north of the Gulf Stream protects us. It all depends on how fast the hurricane is moving forward. If a hurricane is moving forward 35 miles an hour or more, as it leaves the Gulf Stream, it's like a car out of control and it's going to hit New York and Long Island with undiminished force. Richard Hendrickson was 18 years old in 38. A native Long Islander, he was a weather observer for the U.S. Weather Bureau, as well as working on his father's farm. I woke up that morning and did the morning chores with the young baby chicks and so forth. At 2.30 in the afternoon, the storm hit Long Island. Forward speed was 60 miles an hour, with sustained winds of 120 miles per hour and gusts of over 150. The worst conditions were over the eastern part of Long Island. The Hamptons saw surges between 15 and 20 feet of water come in over the dunes and just envelop many of the towns on the east end. Few people actually saw the wall of surge coming toward them and managed to live. Water filled with deadly debris pummeled dunes and buildings. Onlookers tried to flee to higher ground ahead of the roaring storm. It covered a tremendous area of Long Island, which is another devastating characteristics of northern hurricanes. They expand and they move faster as they come north. 
Each cubic yard of seawater carried the deadly weight of 1,700 pounds as the surge hammered to pieces massive summer homes. They took the sand dunes and the beach right out and made an opening between Shinnecock Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. And I went down to check the buildings. We had 25 buildings in six acres and all the buildings were smashed. The chickens were blown against the five foot wire fence and drowned with the wind, the rain. Good man would go in a corn lot and cry. The howling storm charged across Long Island Sound and smacked Connecticut and Rhode Island in the face. At rush hour, the storm crashed into downtown Providence, Rhode Island, then a city of 250,000. One witness described the surge pushing water from the bay into downtown was as if someone had turned on a giant water faucet. People were clinging to lampposts. They drowned in their cars. Plate glass windows of department stores popped out. Sofas and washing machines floated by with people riding them like lifeboats. A sporting goods store pushed its inventory of small rowboats out the second story window. Within hours, the same hurricane also wreaked havoc in Massachusetts and Vermont. Because it was so fast moving and so large, affected thousands of square miles, and it downed over two billion trees and affected lots of properties all the way up inland into Worcester, Massachusetts. Every single property on Long Island was had some damage from this storm. There was low-level wind damage all the way up into Canada. Over 60,000 people were left homeless from the 1938 hurricane. The widespread devastation is vividly captured in this extremely rare 1938 color film. Almost 700 people were killed. Thousands were injured. To this day, it is still one of the largest hurricanes to strike the United States. 70 years later, it is almost forgotten. Many historians feel the reason the hurricane has been overlooked is because on that same day, September 21st, 1938, Adolf Hitler annexed Czechoslovakia. Within a year, Europe would be engulfed in war. But to the New Yorkers and New Englanders who survived the hurricane, the storm was no less devastating an attack than Hitler's invasion. But this storm did have one positive impact on the economy. At that time, could get anybody to work for $2 a day. People had to have their doors fixed, their chimney rebuilt, the trees out. I like to say that that was the end of the Depression. Decades since this mega disaster, there has been tremendous development along the East Coast. For example, in 1938, the entire population of Long Island was less than 750,000. Today, more than 3 million live there. There are 20 million people in the surrounding area, all at risk. We have to remember no major hurricane has hit an American coastal urban center. Andrew did not hit Miami, it hit Homestead. Hugo did not hit Charleston, it hit the Isle of Palms. Even the Eye of Katrina actually made landfall in nearby Mississippi, not New Orleans. But what would happen if New York City were directly targeted? The 1938 hurricane would only be a dress rehearsal for a far greater catastrophe. The 1938 hurricane produced enough lumber from downed trees to build 200,000 homes. New York City is staring down the barrel of a gun. A catastrophic hurricane could hit at any time. But wind, rain, and flooding are nothing new to the Big Apple. In fact, New York has a long history of storms. In 1938, a Category 3 storm overwhelmed parts of New York and New England. 
The hurricane missed a direct hit on New York City by less than 75 miles. Winds of 60 to 70 miles an hour were recorded in Central Park. In 1985, New York experienced its closest call with Hurricane Gloria. Gloria was a Category 3 storm that started in the Carolinas and moved north through New Jersey, causing massive flooding. Meteorologists and emergency management experts warned New York to prepare for the worst. But the worst never came. We were watching this storm very closely on the radar, and we watched the whole back part of Gloria fall apart. Hurricane Gloria broke up as it passed over the cold northern waters. By the time it reached New York, most of the winds had decreased to Category 1. There was a small swath of 15 to 20 miles over Suffolk County that did see sustained Category 2 type winds. It was very easy to survive Hurricane Gloria. And yet, parts of Long Island lost power for seven days. Despite $900 million in damage and destruction as far south as North Carolina, New York City had dodged the bullet. We've been very lucky a couple of times over the last few years. Go back to 1999 and we look at Floyd as it was coming up the coast as it came off of the Virginia Capes. It was no longer a hurricane. We breathed a sigh of relief, because that was pretty damn close to us. Isabel, 2003, another one. It hit down in the Carolinas, but slowly made that northwest turn, and we had damage all the way up into southern Jersey, a couple hundred miles to the north. That same type of storm, that would have affected significantly New York City. Statistics and weather data indicate the next big storm could be less forgiving. To begin with, both the Gulf and the Atlantic Basin have recently seen fluctuations in water temperature. We're in the multi-decadal cycle of warm surface temperatures of the Atlantic. We can go back to about 1870 and we see a cycle of every 25 to 30 years we go through temperatures which are warmer than normal for about 25 to 30 years and then colder than normal. These warmer, colder, and wetter, drier cycles may have been exacerbated by global warming. Because of global warming, because of our rising sea level, well, warmer ocean waters in the future, and I like to say the near future, we are going to have a severe hurricane. But it is not just the frequency of these hurricanes during the current warm period that is causing concern. There has also been tremendous construction along the coast during the last cold water period. We went through a period from the mid-60s to the mid-90s where the Atlantic Basin was a little bit below normal as far as water temperature goes. Now that's when the coast was developed and people didn't have the hurricane experience. Tremendous coastal buildup, a complacent population, increasing hurricane activity, a deadly mix for New York City. But until 15 years ago, scientists' best guess was that the Northeast only experienced these larger hurricanes every 150 years or so. That means the city would not be due for a major storm until around 2075. But that thinking changed after a few pieces of pottery were found on a New York City beach in 1995. We're in the Auburn section of Rockaway, part of New York's public beach system. And not many New Yorkers know that after the Civil War, out there, 1,000 feet, was a resort island called Hog Island. And it had causeways and uh, playhouses and saloons and restaurants. The area just offshore was dredged after a series of winter storms in the early 1990s. The sand was dumped on this beach in Rockaway, Brooklyn. My students and I, after the ocean was dredged, found this material, artifacts on the beach, and in the process of dating it, we rediscovered the great 1893 hurricane that devastated the shoreline of New York. Dr. Koch's students were able to cross-reference the items they found on the beach 
and determine a period in the early 1890s when it was possible that all these different artifacts could have been in the same location. The 1893 storm was forgotten, but it's very clear in the New York Times, all six columns of the front page talk about the extreme devastation that occurred on the New York shoreline. Hog Island was completely destroyed by the 1893 hurricane. We began to narrow the recurrence interval of a major storm on the New York shoreline to something more like 75 to 90 years, from 125 to 150 years. In this year, we realize that we're running close to the statistical recurrence of a hurricane. Where it will be, we don't know, but it could be almost overdue. And the storms of the recent past give strong hints about the size of the damage to come. The October 91 perfect storm. Water during this storm pounds New York, and the PATH train tunnel fills with water. Swells of 10 to 30 feet crash into the shore from North Carolina to Nova Scotia. Fall of 93 and spring of 94. Huge nor'easters slam into New York City, dumping more rain and pushing high winds across the five boroughs. More than 50 motorists have to be rescued by dive teams on the FDR drive. The February blizzard of 2006. 26.9 inches of snow paralyzed the city. The largest snowfall in the recorded history of New York. Misses are getting closer, and when a Category 3 storm does hit, New Yorkers will not have to look far to see the potential consequences. Katrina. The reverberations of this killer hurricane that devastated the Gulf region are still being felt today. Katrina took a very bad track. It hit a major populated area, so it was a very deadly hurricane because it had strong winds, it had high storm surge, it was very large, and it hit very populated areas along the coastline. The Katrina statistics are stunning. Over 1,600 confirmed fatalities, $80 billion in losses and counting, 80% of a major urban population displaced, interstate highways destroyed, a cultural center of the United States left in ruins. Katrina was a deadly wake-up call to emergency management experts, politicians, and the public. But is New York City listening? 26-foot storm surge. 20 inches of driving rain. Killer 130-mile-per-hour winds. Meteorological estimates predict a Category 3 storm could leave New York City under siege. But before a hurricane can attack one of America's most vital and important cities, it will quietly begin life thousands of miles away in Africa. A hurricane basically, as it starts out, it's a wave, it's a buckle in the tropical easterlies. And what happens is, as that buckle starts to move from east to west, it develops some disturbances. A disturbance is a small area of low pressure. As these disturbances move across the Atlantic, they pick up more energy as warm water evaporates and is sucked up into the clouds. After 24 hours, these disturbances start to form into clusters of thunderstorms. If a low pressure system develops along these thunderstorms, you're going to start to see a depression. A depression is a region of low barometric pressure. As that depression intensifies and the winds intensify to tropical storm strength, 39 miles an hour or greater, it becomes a tropical storm. Winds in this type of depression start to pick up as the size of the thunderstorms increase. Once those winds increase, that low pressure has sustained winds around it of 74 miles an hour or greater, it becomes a hurricane. As a hurricane like this works its way up the coast, knocking out power and causing flooding, the biggest problem awaiting New York City is going to be coastal storm surge. 
A lot of people don't consider New York a coastal th a city, but we do have 478 miles of coastline here. And everyone should understand that no matter where on Long Island a hurricane hits, New York City will get abnormal surge response from it. And as that surge dome comes into the land, on top of it are superimposed waves that are formed from the wind. Surge levels can be predicted by a slosh model. Slosh stands for sea, lake, and overland surge from hurricanes. In this slosh model for a Category 3 hurricane moving northwest over northern New Jersey and placing the right eye wall over New York City, the storm surge at Jamaica Bay could be 28 feet. Along the Brooklyn waterfront, it could top 20 feet. Wall Street surge levels could rise to 18 feet. Here we are at the southernmost point of New York City, what we call the Battery. And here's where the surge is going to first affect the land. And the, the winds driving the water into the right angle between New York and New Jersey will push water through the narrows into this bay. Sea levels have risen a foot and a half since the early 19th century. At high tide, a surge of this size could be at least 18 feet for a mere Category 2 hurricane. The storm surge will roll in with such power that small structures along the coastline will be totally leveled. As water smashes into doors and windows, it will create and collect more debris. People think that hurricane winds and hurricane waters are pure. They are not. They're full of the debris that the hurricane has come down. So rather than water or air hitting you, you feel like a battering ram. And story after story in every hurricane has shown that many people have died directly from being smashed by the debris. Some people who live maybe five miles inland on Flatbush Avenue don't realize that they are in a storm surge inundation area. They're five miles from the coast. In the right situation, there could be some sort of level of storm surge there. The storm surge in New York will create unique problems that other cities have never had to face. Here we are on the subways, which are one of New York's greatest assets, but also a source of great concern during a severe storm. Our subway tunnels flood in fresh water when we have nor'easter storms and in a hurricane we'll actually have salt water in the system and that will do corrosion in addition to submerging it. Salt water is a challenge uh, when the subway was designed. I'm sure it was not planned to be filled with salt water. Um, obviously any electric components, the switching and the wiring will be affected by salt water. Storm surge will not be the only danger New Yorkers face. There will be significant amount of wind damage from a major hurricane hitting New York. Even though New York City itself is populated with large, high-rise, very substantial buildings that are not going to topple over in a major hurricane, these buildings will still experience extensive damage. Even if the storm is a category three storm on the typical height that these wind speeds are measured, which is about 10 meters, as you get higher, the wind speeds increase. So if at the ground we're experiencing a category three hurricane, a skyscraper is experiencing a category five wind. The real danger from wind is debris. I think the principal concern for New York when that happens will be objects on the roof that aren't tied down, air conditioner systems, water tanks. The rooftops of New York harbor a deadly arsenal of airborne missiles, ready to rain down on every sidewalk and street. You see water towers, construction cranes, and other microwave towers on top of the buildings. In Brooklyn, Queens and Long Island, there will be other wind-related problems. Wood frame buildings in a strong Cat 3, Cat 4 can suffer complete collapse. Initially, equal pressure on the inside and outside of a house will keep the building from collapsing. But if the wind breaks the windows, then that pressure is transmitted to the interior, sucking that wind into the building. The pressure from the outside pushes it in as well. Together, they create a critical mass. This pressure pushes at the roof of the building, forcing it up. When the negative pressure created by the wind blowing over the exterior is added to this equation, the roof can blow right off. 
With storm surge and wind battering New York City, infrastructure will also begin to fall apart. As Katrina demonstrated, that damage will be unbelievable. Many roads will be washed out and you will have lots of businesses who will be obviously shut down for extended periods of time, so there'll be a lots of loss of income. It'll be hard for people to get back into work even when the storm has passed. But it's not an entirely hopeless scenario. New York has evacuation advantages over other cities because the elevation level rises quickly within the city limits. Residents will need to walk just a short distance to higher ground, not drive the 50 or 60 miles that we have seen choke highways in other evacuations. And if they prepare properly and heed the evacuation order, these are survivable uh, events. Preparedness comes through anticipation and rehearsal. But how does New York rehearse for such an unpredictable event? Next, using computer-generated special effects and rare storm footage, we will ride into the eye of a fast-moving Category 3 storm as it barrels north. Destination? New York City. Category 4 or 5 North Atlantic hurricanes have increased 56% over the last 35 years. Seven a.m., New York City. A beautiful September morning sometime in the future. The National Hurricane Center has watched a storm off the coast of Florida turn and head north overnight. The storm is massive, with a radius of more than 100 miles across and an eye wall of 12 miles, and it's rapidly expanding. Once a hurricane reaches Miami, it's no more than a day and a half away from New York City. That day is today. A devastating Category 3 hurricane is about to batter New York City with deadly force. The countdown has begun. So what we're going to see is when that hurricane moves to Cape Hatteras, we're only six to eight hours away, but yet on Long Island, the sky's going to look very good. Once the hazard is identified, regardless of intensity, it could be a tropical depression that's going to make a direct landfall all the way to a major hurricane. And the city will begin to coordinate internally. But people are going to notice that huge waves are coming in. And then the huge waves are going to continue and their nature is going to change. And then the sky over three hours is going to become dark. And if you've waited to this time, it's too late to get out. At this point, New Yorkers have only a few options. Move away from any area exposed to water below 30 feet in elevation. Stay away from windows. Go to the interior stairwell of your building and hunker down. At three hours, we're going to be experiencing extremely heavy surf and gale force winds. So it's going to be getting darker and darker. Rain is going to start to fall. The rain will become more and more horizontal with time. Then the front part of the hurricane will move in and the devastating phase goes on. Rush hour, the category three mega hurricane hits town. The strongest winds and storm surge are on the right side of the hurricane, slamming into the harbor. The surge will come up slowly at first, and then as that eye makes landfall, it'll just come up as a big wave, inundate from Coney Island on right up into the southern tip of Manhattan. A tsunami-like wall of water will smash into every inch of the coast. These deadly surges will first devastate outlying coastal areas of the city. As the hurricane continues north, surge levels will build. The financial district in lower Manhattan could see water as far north as Canal Street. The current home of the city's Office of Emergency Management is vulnerable, located in a flood zone near the Brooklyn Bridge. Icons begin to fall. Water levels at the battery start to rise at more than a foot an hour. 
The water seeps in through every drain and tunnel entrance, flooding subway tracks and bringing mass transit to a halt. Our utility system is underground, very susceptible to storm surge. In Times Square, swirling winds of over 100 miles an hour send neon and glass spinning everywhere. Solid masonry buildings like the Empire State Building and modern steel high-rises stand fast against the storm, but their windows are pummeled and shattered by flying debris. At JFK Airport, Jamaica Bay swells to 28 feet, flooding the landing zones. On the outlying beaches, 22-foot storm surge and 130-mile-an-hour winds pummel single-family homes. Skies suddenly clear as the eye makes landfall. But this is only a lull before phase two hits. It will basically come up and come right back out as that eye makes landfall and moves, the winds will turn around as the storm moves past and push all the water back out along with all the debris and do a lot more damage as the water retreats. The storm charges into the suburban counties north of the city, wreaking more wind and water damage. Hopefully everybody will be sheltered uh, uh, in facilities that are safe. You know, there may be a period where there is a, a large loss of power, but uh, with the redundancies in place, we hope to limit that as much as possible. Ten hours later, the storm dissipates in light wind and rain over upstate New York and Canada. In New York City, rescue and cleanup operations are already underway. But it will take weeks to get the city back to normal. Citizens should expect to be on their own for up to 72 hours and make the provisions now to lessen that impact when it happens. Stranded motorists will be pulled from car roofs by Coast Guard and city police. The few survivors of the tsunami-like surges in beachfront communities will start to crawl out from the wreckage of their homes. A hit on a major city like New York will easily have national repercussions. There will not only be damage to the infrastructure, but there will be interruption of work, which will have tremendous economic consequences for the country as a whole. One scenario that we should be prepared for is a storm that is about the same intensity of the 1938 hurricane. And that type of event, again, the same intensity as the 1938, the same size, the same forward speed storm would cause insured damages in excess of $50 billion, but total economic damages well in excess of $100 billion. The tragic failures of Hurricane Katrina are another stark reminder of the high cost of ignoring this potential mega disaster. I think Katrina should have been a wake up call for everyone in this country as just how devastating these events can be. But experts and scientists are optimistic that New York can survive this doomsday scenario. Uh, values are getting better and better. We're getting much, much more accurate as far as our forecasts go with the uh, path of the storm. Newscasts will provide plenty of advance warning. The media sees these things. They're hyped up to death. So that's a, that's a fortunate thing in some ways. But no amount of warning can change one fact. A killer hurricane will one day hit New York City. A geologist understands from the first day of class that the coast is the fastest changing part of the continents. We're on a collision course with Mother Nature, and Mother Nature always wins.